does this get you good outcomes? Does this make the kids happy? Are they having fun? Those mm -hmm. are the metrics that I use. Morning, David. Good morning, Susan. How are you today? All right. The kitchen renovation is moving forward again, which is nice. So you might hear some saws occasionally. Right, right. It's a very exciting time. We had a little challenge and the challenge was to compliment and it- Celebrate. 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 I didn't even do celebration. I forgot about that part. It's so easy to forget. It's very difficult because we're set in patterns and that's all we are. We're pattern oriented. We get in our patterns of correcting our kids. We get in our patterns of how we communicate with our spouse or our partner. And we get in patterns of how we communicate with our workers or the people that we work with. It's always in my head going, I want to do this. I got to correct and go to the compliment, you know, get mm -hmm. right to the compliment first. Mm -hmm. and so it is a very challenging thing to do, mm -hmm. but you know what? It takes time. It takes time mm -hmm. to change the pattern. It's it's like a dance. You're, you're dancing between mm -hmm. your old pattern and a new pattern. And once you recognize it, you have a choice. Once you mm -hmm. see that you're okay. Oh, I'm at that crossroad. You can either go with the old pattern or I want to switch to the new pattern. It takes mm -hmm. time. It takes time for obviously the brain and how it works to rewire itself to go to that new pattern. Mm -hmm. Obviously, mm -hmm. it, it can be done. It can be done. So mm -hmm. I get a lot more good things out of it when I'm complimenting. As I have is when Darcy and her girlfriend have done something and you want to correct them. And it's like, how do, how do I parent this with the compliment method? It gets very challenging. Do you have any experience at all or how was your week? So it was celebrate. Uh, actually, that's how I took it. I did ask my husband how he liked to celebrate. And, and to him, celebration meant to pause and draw attention to an accomplishment. It, it didn't have to be going out to dinner or something like that. He just wanted the moment. Two or three times I paused in the week and I said, hey, you're doing a really hard thing and we should acknowledge that or that he's doing a good job. He never believes that he's doing a good job. What I have to do is be very specific about the thing that I said he did. Mm -hmm. Let's see. My kids have been washing dishes for us during the renovation. We replaced our mechanical dishwasher with a couple of human dishwashers. <laughs> One night they had come back up from the basement from spending a little bit of time washing dishes. It actually doesn't take that long to wash the dishes, but when they do it, it takes a long time. They're talking, they're goofing around. They had come back from being in the basement for 45 minutes. I said, you guys have been our dishwasher for the entire project. And I want to appreciate that you've been doing this for us. So that was one. Another one was my daughter, we always have to get after her to do her homework. She gets good grades, but that's because we're after her to do the homework. I asked her, is your homework done? And she said, yes. And I said, oh, I'm proud of you. That was really good. So tried to do one every day and I mostly succeeded. That's great. Yeah. It is difficult because we're always looking for completion of projects, meaning yeah. completing the washing of dishes, complete doing your homework. Now go to the next step, make your bed, get ready for school the next day. It's the grocery list. It's that list mm -hmm. all the time. And we have to compliment the accomplishments, reward them, say, wow, that was really great. Yeah. And I tend to listen more with my wife, who's a school teacher, and she has a lot of things she's going through at school with kids. And it's June, they're all trying to make up the whole year and their grades mm -hmm. so they can pass. And and in my head, it's, I don't need to solve anything. I just need to listen. I keep saying that to my... That's just, right. Just That's listen. That's right. I understand. I just try to keep reminding her, you're a great teacher. You really care about all these kids. But you don't need to do it all. You, you can't. Mm -hmm. It's, it's mm -hmm. impossible. Just do what you mm -hmm. can. And that's all you can do. Mm -hmm. You care about them all. You care yep. about them all. So, and she has many stories and I'm not going to talk about her stories on this, on this program, but I, I think that the advice that I've learned to myself is that the more I, I compliment and just listen and I understand and just let them be who they are, really accept them 
for how yeah. she's teaching. Don't try to yeah. know how to teach. Just yeah, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes I'll go to my husband and and I, I just want to complain. It's like this thing went wrong. It could be like a, a piece of equipment, a piece of software is not doing what I want. It's like this thing went wrong, tries to give me suggestions for fixing it. And then we end up in friction because I don't want his suggestions and he senses me not wanting. And then he pushes. It's like, no, but it'll make your life better if you just did this thing. I'll, I'm I'm solving your problem for you. And I'm going, mm, and so it's friction. Sometimes we can get to the end. It's like, why am I fighting with you? And I said, that's because you're trying to solve my problem. I just need you to hear me. I mean, I think it's a fundamental human need to be seen and to be understood. Mm -hmm. That is the need that you are fulfilling. Us men, I'll be straight up since I try to do this. When you come to me with a problem, I want to solve it. That's <laughs> kind of the way we are. You have a problem? Okay, let's solve it. What's? I'll tell you the answer. Or if I can't find the answer, I'll go and look for the answer. So, And I think what you're saying <laughs> is that... I don't need that. I just need you to listen to me. Yeah. You know, I just need to get this off my chest. And yeah. I want you to answer it. I'll ask you, please help me. What do I do here? Yes. And yes. That's usually when we're like, oh, I was in the listening mode. Now you want me to solve. <laughs> both of you are good listeners and both of you are trying to be good listeners. What my husband does is he listens, he does do the listen, and then he moves into problem solving. Sometimes we realize it's like, oh yeah, I moved into problem solving there and I didn't need to, or that I thought I was done the listening. It's so true. It is so true. Yeah. So, so last night at the rink, I was presented with, a question and mm -hmm. uh, the question was very simple how much of analytics should we bring to kids hockey oh i have thoughts i have thoughts i'm a number cruncher and i have a background in statistics i think you should record who scored the goal you should record assists these are basic you you always record them um, i also think you should record when you did it and like in the moment, you need that. The other thing is, I don't know how, how to record this in the moment. You might be able to get this from video afterwards. Is like, is what the line looked like when it happened. Like, who were you playing with? Because if I'm making lines later on, I want to know who you're playing well with. The other thing is, what the line looks like when you get a shot on goal, even if it's not successful, if, even if it's not a score. Those are my basic thoughts. These are basic hockey statistics. There's nothing exciting here, but how you use them and how you get them are the interesting question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What was interesting at that, there's these new companies that are coming out. They're bringing analytics to sports and not just hockey, but many sports, soccer, mm -hmm. lacrosse, whatever. It was presented to me last night. What do you think of these companies that are coming to us with these analytics? I said, well, what's interesting is that most of these rinks, we'll just take hockey right now. Mm -hmm. They have cameras set up. There's cameras set up in the rinks and they have a camera in the middle and they have cameras at each end. So they have these mm -hmm. three cameras. These companies can use these cameras to take hockey analytics. I really didn't dive into exactly what they're analyzing, mm -hmm. but uh, they can analyze more than just goals, assist, penalties, the time of these infractions or these goals, plus minus, face-off wins, giveaways. There's a whole bunch of things that kind of go into hockey analytics. Now, mm -hmm. we know that there's many general managers now trying to use hockey analytics or drafting players. I said, they probably want to get away from missing certain players or NHL Hall of Famers to be being drafted in the 12th round, like a Luke Robitaille, or the mm -hmm. seventh round, like a Paul Coffey. That list goes on and on. All these Hall of Famers that were drafted late. How do we make sure that we draft these quality players in the right rounds, the first round, mm -hmm. second round, so forth? Now, who uses these hockey analytics? Should the parents have the hockey analytics? Should they have all these stats of everything that goes on? Or is it just the coaches that? 
And then how do the coaches use the hockey analytics? Do they share it with the kids? How much should you share with the players? And how much should you keep and retain to yourself? It's really quite interesting because I think the other thing is that we can use the data, but you still need to use that real life watching. Who's passionate about the game? Who does the extra practicing? Who loves showing up to the rink early? Who stays a little bit later? Who's being dragged to the rink? There's a whole bunch of things that we really can't use hockey analytics, but you have to use your common sense, but also your human side to evaluate what's going on as well. Because I don't think there's a perfect way to analyze players uh, to say this is the best player. This is the 100th best player. Mm -hmm. Um, There's just too many things involved. These are all good questions and standard questions for any kind of process improvement program that is based Mm -hmm. on statistics. The first question you need to ask is what is your goal? Mm -hmm. What are you trying to do with all these numbers? Back in the old days, five years ago, (laughs) every number that you calculate or you record, you have to do it by hand. But now you have all of this AI that can generate statistics for you and you can quickly become overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. It's too much. You don't know what to do with it. You also get numbers. You don't know what they mean. This is an AI problem as much as it is a human problem. I did X per unit time. Is a high number good or is a low number good? Mm -hmm. So you need to have an understanding of what this represents with respect to your goal. So if you're going to use this number to change behavior, you better be sure that this is what you're going to optimize on. So if, for example, you want people to complete more more pieces per hour, Mm -hmm. well, you got to make sure they're not cutting corners to just put them through quickly. You want them to complete it at a high quality as well. So you have to be careful what metrics that you use to turn the knobs of behavior. Mm -hmm. If you can frame in terms of what's the goal, Mm -hmm. if the goal is to rank the best players, sure. I, I think the standard statistics that people use for Hall of Famers, they're as good as anything right now because that's based a lot on human intuition. The question is, is there some other statistic we should be using that we haven't been collecting and using so far because it was too hard? I'm going to make something up that's going to sound really good, but it doesn't really mean anything. I want to know if someone's skate patterns conform to a Fourier transformation or if they correspond to the most efficient Bezier curve to get from one side of the ice to the other. That's the kind of thing that you can generate now, but what does it mean? Who knows? If you're trying to rank, and, and this is what Moneyball does. We are valuing players the wrong way. We should be looking at how much they earn in runs for us per game Mm -hmm. as opposed to oh he's got style he's got attitude or he's got the the the, there's this montage in the moneyball movie where it's these scouts saying things me as a layperson doesn't know anything about baseball goes what are they saying what you're asking is, can we moneyball hockey? It's like, we probably can moneyball hockey. There's a pretty good chance that somebody is already moneyballing hockey. Mm-hmm. And so that's what they're doing with it. If we're doing something other than doing a ranking of players, say, for example, I want to make my players better. I've got a kid on my team. I want him to be, uh, become a better defense. He skates like he doesn't have a care in the world. So the puck goes near him. He just very leisurely goes to the puck. The forward beats him every time, even if they're coming from on the other side of the ice. I can motivate him by getting to skate faster in practice. He's a decently good skater, but he just doesn't have the fire in the belly to go and fight for that puck. How do I use analytics to do that? I don't know the answer, but here's what I do know. When you are watching the game, you are following the puck. You are seeing where the action is. With these cameras, you can have a complete record of the entire ice for the entire game. You can go back to the video and see what this kid was doing over here in the corner when the action was over here. You can give them feedback on, oh, 
you should have been here, you should have been paying attention to this and see when this puck came in, you, this is how you could have reacted. So that's something that you can get that you couldn't otherwise get. It's very achievable and it's very understandable. Absolutely. When I'm listening to you, there's two different analytics. You have your individual skill analytics, and then you have your game analytics. With your individual skill, obviously we know to improve the player, we improve skating, stick handling, shooting, passing, all those individual skills. There's a lot more skills than just that. I, I realize that. There's the team skill as well of the individual, how to play as a team, who's open, who to pass to, how do we move up and how do we move back? How do we work on the power play? Mm -hmm. How do we work on penalty killing? Then we transition this all over to the game. Mm -hmm. how, much have they how much have they retained? Uh, how much confidence do they have in themselves? Mm -hmm. And as we go through, we can evaluate through analytics of the game. Oh, this player made 10 good passes, but gave away 10 bad plays, gave the puck up 10 times. Maybe there's a situation right here. What is that player doing during a certain time? Some players that's go, wow, this player is really good. They had three goals. And this mm -hmm. player over here didn't have any goals. But then when we watch, the player had three goals standing at the far blue line waiting for the pass. He's never in your end. So mm -hmm. there's a lot more be behind the scenes than just evaluating goals mm -hmm. and assist points. It's really, is he playing as a team? Is she in the correct position as we're going through? So there's a lot to take in. There is a lot to take in. And the simpler you can make it, the better it is for everyone. Because once you've got too much, anything more than three, you know, we're, we're going to lose anybody, mm -hmm. even at the, the high end adults. So mm -hmm. I think with kids, you just want to keep it very simple and engaging. You, you want to keep them engaged all the time. That compliment. Here we are talking about complimenting last week. We can't go straight into correcting right away. We almost have to give two to three compliments, correction, and two or three more compliments to make mm -hmm. them feel good, mm -hmm. right? Before we're coming out of that evaluation period. So, yeah, and closing the gap on individual skills well as the kids get older they're going to get better anyways we know that their skating is going to be stronger faster but it's kind of presented to them where do we need to close the gap can you raise the puck no maybe that's something we can work on let's start re learning how to raise the puck all your crossovers eh, good one way not good the other way well maybe that's something we work on this year maybe every year we have an individual goal for the skills we have those team skills as well keeping it simple Let's mm -hmm. not overwhelm our players mm -hmm. for success. So, mm -hmm. I have a question for you. When sure. you were a player, they did you use video at all? No, not at all. Oh, okay. No, hang on. I'm thinking back when I was like six and seven, my dad would do the videoing. Do you mean when we were, I was at college? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like did, did your coach? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the analytics are new, but we've had video for a long time. I graduated from university. Hang on to your pants, 1991. We're talking 30 plus years ago. Back then, they would have someone in the stands videoing every single game, and they yeah. would then analyze the game and then have more of a correction period. So, yeah. and it was more of a teaching period because there's just so much to watch. And you can only sit in a room for so long. You can sit there and watch the whole game for three hours and that wouldn't be any good for anybody. So, but yeah, it was really great to watch. It was very difficult to watch because the first thing you would, you would say, do I skate like that? Oh my gosh, I skate awful. All of a sudden we get self evaluating ourselves. Oh my God, look at me skate. Look at me this, look at me that. What am I doing? <laughs> once you kind of get over that then you can kind of move forward into see right here dave you're a little bit you're about 10 feet ahead of the play if you're 10 feet back of the play you're in a better position to break out simple things like that would really benefit each and every hockey player as we move forward but yes we didn't have it in junior or midget so it was just probably just coming in it was just probably coming yeah. into into times yes Based on how much we know about analytics and hockey, I think you'll get most of the benefit from that video. Based on what I know about analytics, you can generate these numbers, but until we get smarter about what numbers are important, unless you have a propeller head who's willing to really go down deep into the numbers. 
Mm -hmm. figure out what is meaningful for your team because Mm -hmm. every team is different. The ice is different. The people on the team is different. The skills, like every team is different. This is what we do in industry. Any model that we use, we have to tune for the particular environment. We're in oil and gas. We know the theory is this way, but we got to make the model work for this particular drill. That's correct. This particular oil well. So I think that's kind of where we're at in terms of the analytics. I think there's, we on a human scale, if we have the video, we can watch it together and learn. It's very basic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You have to gauge it towards whatever age, skill that we're dealing with. Each and every team is different too. I was just thinking about your select team or maybe Mm -hmm. Darcy's select team. If you videoed the game, you just want to keep it very simple. All right, this is kind of where we are as a team. We got def- two defense in the defensive zone, but the puck is in the offensive zone. We need those defense to move up. But maybe in the head, those defense are thinking, we cannot let any goals in. We're going to stay back here and protect our net. But they, they need to learn that. You just kind of magically show in the video, this is where we want you to be. As the puck moves up and down, this is how we're going to try and work as a team. It works so much more efficiently. And mm-hmm. better for two things. Number one, to move forward offensively, to create battles when we do lose the puck, so we can get that puck back and start attacking again. What do you think is a good age to start doing this? Oh, that's a that's a great question. I'm just guessing. Nine. Okay. That's not a bad guess. I I think five is too young. Six is too young. Seven is too young. Eight's Mm -hmm. a maybe. Twelve, middle school age. Mm -hmm. Middle school grade six, seven, eight. So we're aligning. We're not too far apart here. I think the key is Mm self-awareness. Middle school, you're starting to develop the self-awareness. And then high school, you've really got the self-awareness. And that's why teenagers are so have so much angst that is like they're all self-awareness but until you have that self-awareness you can't self-criticize you can't see something on the screen and relate that to something that you need to do that Mm -hmm. that's me that's me Mm -hmm. i can control that i know that the other thing sort of cut you off susan is Mm -hmm. that with hockey canada mandating we have cross ice hockey and then we go to half ice hockey. Then we go to full ice hockey. The full ice hockey happens in around the nine-year-old age group. What are we really watching and evaluating with a cross ice game to a half ice game? Even that's a little bit more challenging. It's really about a lot of touches. The, they're kind of promoting, we want the kids on the ice. We want them changing quickly every two minutes. In addition to that, lots of touching, lots of touching the puck. Touch the puck, touch the puck, move the puck. There is strategy in the half ice game too, but it all depends on how much skill level your your kids have. This makes sense. The way I understand, or, or I mean, the why these smaller ice surfaces make sense to me is that you have more opportunities to use the skills. Because if you have the big ice surfaces, you get tired out for no reason. You have to skate a long way when you're five years old to go score on the other end of the ice. It's kind of like dead time. It's not very exciting. If you have a good player, they just kind of take off and you can't catch them. If you don't have a good player, they lose the puck and then it's a mess. So when you have cross ice, You just have less skating and you have more, as you say, touches. You just have more interactions going on, more opportunities to use skills. And and that makes sense to me. You use these skills instead of tiring yourself out, skating over long distances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a backyard hockey game. When you're playing in a backyard, everyone's included. From one end to the other end is a very short distance. Even if you can't skate that well, you you can somehow maneuver yourself to, to try to start to participate and to be involved in the game. You're absolutely right. When you're using full ice, the kids that can skate the best are the only ones that touch the puck. Yeah. And you'll see at the five, six, seven-year-olds, these players tend to dominate the game because they can skate extremely well. They go from one end to the other one. There's really no one to pass to unless they have someone of equal, equal right. skill. Yeah. Right? But the other ones, yeah. they can't keep up. I'm not passing backwards. So 
And then once I shoot the puck, someone on the other team of the same equal skill will grab the puck and then go down to the other end. It's uh, a lot of these parents are very traditional. So, so am I. But you have to be open to new ideas and to expanding to grow the game, but to make it simple and more fun for the kids. I think going from cross ice to half ice to full ice is very good metrics. But then you're, you're always going to have your elite kids. Yeah, there, there's going to be some very questioning about the kids who are AAA when they're eight and nine, and there's a, a very large group of them. I understand that. That's for a discussion when you get to that point. So, but it's just fun. It's fun in the beginning. Hockey is all about having fun and even sport. You look at soccer. Would you want to have five, six year olds play on a full soccer field? It makes no sense. If you want to have curling, if you have younger curlers, they said, let's wait till the curlers are 12, 13, 14. Well, you're not going to have many curlers starting at that age because they're already involved in other sports. Yeah. You have to involve them sooner and then try to make games and curling. We don't have to use the full ice, half mm -hmm. ice. Mm -hmm. And we have to adapt. We have to adapt. Kids just want to play and have fun. It's not all about who's going to go to the Olympics, who's going to play for Team Canada. Uh, in the end, there's only a select few at all these sports. But there's a whole bunch of us who do enjoy to play these sports. Let's get them involved. Yeah, I like, and what you're saying about tradition, I don't come from a hockey background. So all bets are off because right. I don't even know what the vets are. Does this make sense? Does this get you good outcomes? Does this make the kids happy? Are they having fun? Those mm -hmm. are the metrics that I use. But sometimes that gets me into a little bit of trouble because I'm, I'll walk into something and there's a certain way that things are done. And then I'm surprising people because it's not done that way. Right. Yeah. Right. Here's a great question. When should we have goalies in hockey? And should we have smaller nets? So the players have to do a lot more passing and skating and, and maybe hit a net that's like 12 inches by 12 inches the play goes back and forth a lot quicker mm -hmm. you know, I, i've mm -hmm. watched house league goalies and half of them just stand there mm -hmm. uh, the games are very large numbers and after you, you've pumped in four or five goals lots of tears start coming out well that's good for that goalie to learn to be tough oh, okay they don't know how to play the net they don't know how to play goalie they they have no skills when do we start you just throw them in the fire is that a good uh... way there's a few different things to respond to in there. Let me kind of sure. peel the onion. It's not toughness. You should never teach someone that their job is to be a punching bag because that sets them up for not success later. We talk about new school versus old school. This is very old school. I don't want my kid to ever think that their job is to take punishment and not complain. But on the flip side, I think there's some kind of resiliency that is worthwhile to teach mm -hmm. and for people to have. It's like, okay, they scored a goal on me. I got to shake it off, shake it off, take a breath, whole new game. You got to leave that behind. It's not about me. It's about the game. I'm doing my job. And I also tell kids, the goalie is one member of a team you are responsible just as much as the goalie is you got to set your goalie up for success you got to make sure that they your goalie doesn't get any shots on goal like mm -hmm. that, that that's the kind of stuff should they we use smaller nets sure why not because it's proportional you have in the nhl you have these very big people with very big pads occupying the net why wouldn't we do something proportional okay that makes sense to me. Should we have goalies at all? Actually, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I mean, you could play with empty net. You can also put, I've seen like vinyl with holes in it on the net. So corresponding to over the shoulder, under the arm, between the legs, there's something like that for the, for the goalie. I'm okay with that. Here's an observation that I have. It's often difficult to get kids to play goalie. Mm -hmm. I find that about half the time is because their parents don't want them to play goal. It's not the kids don't want to play goal. It's that the parents don't want to play goal because it's too nerve wracking to watch them. Mm -hmm. I think there's something to unpack there. I, I think there's some, I don't know, 
I think it's healthy to to think about for the parents to think about what the future looks like and you have to separate from the kid. How do you encourage them? How do you support them as opposed to I'm protecting them? If you're not really protecting them, you're protecting yourself. There's there's some questions to be asked. When do kids get to start playing goalie? I don't know. I, I'm okay with putting little kids in goal because mm. the shots aren't that hard and mm. you have to have that first contact to overcome any you know, apprehension that they have, then it builds the habit. I'm part of the team. If you're on the team, you play goal, we all take a turn. It's not just one person's job. It's all of our job. Mm -hmm. So those are my thoughts. So I'm not a goalie and I'm not a goalie expert, but the the one thing when you look at it in house league, every team is given from the organization, usually a bag of equipment. I know that on my daughter's team this year, some of the girls were maybe about three and a half feet tall to five and a half feet tall, but it's the same goalie pads and goalie equipment for that person. And, and the gloves were so big, they even were too big for my hands. So here you have these little hands going in and they can barely hold the gloves and they're just doing the best they can. And I'm just wondering, especially at house league level, AAA is completely different. Goalie equipment is very expensive. And that's probably why a lot of parents want to kind of stay away from that. Because mm-hmm. almost every other year, every two years, you got to buy new goalie equipment again. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's some trade in places so you can get mm-hmm. some money back on your goalie equipment, which is great. I'm just always wondering if there is a better way to start teaching these goalies at a younger age, Mm -hmm. rather than just kind of standing there and putting all this equipment on and it's kind of bulky and all that. I wonder if there's just a a different way. I've never thought of it, but I'm just wondering. Good question. When I coached house league last year, I had two bags. I had one bag for the average size player. I had another bag for the above average size player. I had some players that were very big. They were a solid head bigger than the other than the other kids. Um, so bigger pads, bigger chest protector. They use the same gloves. I should have had another uh, another stick, um, but I didn't. One of the reasons I wanted to have that second bag is because I had some big kids who said, they wanted to play goal. They normally are star players, so they put them on forward. I had one particular kid, he skates amazingly well. Every time he gets a puck, he's a playmaker. He caps out at three goals per game every game. He had never in his entire life played goalie. I said, you are more important to me than the goals you put in the net. I want you to have the opportunity to play goalie. So that's what I did. I would say two thirds of my team play in goal, which I'm told is very unusual for this age group. Mm -hmm. I would say half of the people who went in goal were playing goalie for the first time in their career. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what I did that was different, but this is an example of me not knowing what is normally the case. It's like, you want to play net? You play net. I don't Mm -hmm. care if you let goals in. I want you to have a good time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all you want. If you have a a player on your team that just loves being a goalie, is passionate about being goalie, uh, then you're very lucky. I know on Darcy's team, we just kind of rotated around. And that worked very well this year. So, Mm -hmm. but once we've gone through the game at once, it's harder to gain would you like to try it again? No, I don't want to play that again. <laughs> we're, we're just fine. We're very fortunate. We had about three or four girls that definitely would like to play net twice or even three times. So, and that's, that's great. That's great when that happens. If you're, I think one of the teams had the select goalie, but she wanted to play out. That's fun too, right? That's good for them to have that opportunity to play out. Also didn't force anyone to play goal. Only the coach's daughter, because when no one wanted to put their hand up, she had to go. (laughs) Yes. They were a couple of kids who didn't want to play goal. And I didn't say you have to do it. I didn't think it was in anybody's best interest to put Mm -hmm. a goalie in the net who didn't want to be there. They would be letting pucks in, so more not having a good time, and we'd be unhappy with them because they're letting the pucks in. I didn't do that. I think uh, in terms of getting house league players, 
to be better goalies, you have some options. Get dads who are goalie, who were former goalies. And I've been very fortunate in that. Also, I had to educate myself. I went and found goalie drills. And sometimes I turn those goalie drills into full team drills, but I'd also figure out how team would be like doing a skating drill. I developed a set of drills that I could do with just the goalie. Sometimes it was rebounds, sometimes it's multiple shots. Sometimes it's it's a goalie skating skill, skating in a square pattern. So you have good situational awareness of the crease. I tended to call the crease, the goalie's the office. This is where the goalie does their work. You don't let other people into the goalie's office. That's the kind of uh, thing that I would say to my team. Um, Hockey Canada has instructor courses that you can take on how to teach being a goalie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, th- there's lots of great stuff out there. Lots of websites. Hockey Canada is one of them. I th- My other advice would be don't have dad teach daughter or son. Mm-hmm. Have a dad teach teach a different. And mm-hmm. strictly because the, the learning is a lot easier that way. When when mom or dad are teaching their own kids, it's it's different. It's definitely different. I think if you have someone else, it just works a lot better. Uh, a lot more encouragement why you don't teach your own kids to drive oh really that's what i heard i've never i haven't taught any of my kids to drive yet but that's what i heard that you don't teach your own kids to drive because it's it's too much friction it's too fraught it's very stressful for both people in the car yes it's it is i remember driving home from one of the hockey rinks and i had to take the queen elizabeth the Garden Expressway, the DVP, the 401 to get home. Yes. And by the DVP, my arms were just dying. They were so <laughs> stressed out. And I heard my dad in the back, I told you we should not have let him dro- drive. Then my mom's like, you're going to be fine. You're okay. You can do this. You can do <laughs> this. <laughs> I didn't look very old, man, when I was 16 years old driving. So, but so we made it home. And uh, we did okay. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So any challenges for the next week, Dave? Susan, I'm actually taking a a leadership course that starts tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It runs till Sunday. And I can let you know how that goes next week. Mm -hmm. I'll look forward to it. I'm a big Tony Robbins guy. And so Mm -hmm. he's offering this leadership course. And I'll look forward to it. Now, most of the time, they have this in person. Part of the leadership course, you have to scale up a telephone pole and then you have to stand on top of it and then you got to jump off of it. This is not in person. This is going to be Zoom. I'm just hoping that we don't have to do anything like that, which I don't think we do. So they didn't send you your personal. You didn't they didn't send you a personal telephone pole? No. (laughs) Well, I got one outside, I guess. I look forward to it. I think life is all about learning and growing and and expanding and you have to take these courses and it, it just really helps it just really mm-hmm. helps you as a person it's going to help me more as a leader running the company being a mm-hmm. dad being a, a partner just being a friend so and i look forward to it i'll let you know all about it next week hey i'm impressed with you dave this constant trying to grow and stretch yourself like you're not staying in one place and you have enough humility to look for teachers yeah well done thank you it's you have to that's the only way if you're not growing you're dying it's very easy to be stale how you run your business how you are at home with your relationships it's like I want a little bit more. How do I do a little bit more? You can either come up with the ideas yourself or you go out and you and you start hunting around for different ideas. So, and you don't have to take everything in. You still have to go, does that work for me? Is that good for me? You have to still apply it that way. But yeah, a lot of good things out there. It's nice to kind of keep moving forward with that. Thanks for the call, Dave. Thank you, Susan. It's been wonderful. Uh- we'll talk to you soon.